The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take your personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Addis. I'm the founder and current editor of Intelligent Investor. I'm here today with Graham Whitcomb, who is joining us from Canada. Good morning, Graham. Hey, John. It is morning for you over there, is it? Uh, no, afternoon. Feeling afternoon. Fine, yeah. Okay. Yeah, why would it be morning when you're 15 hours behind or something? <laughs> I, I lose track all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just one big day. And we also have Nick Cummings here from Newcastle. How are you doing, Nick? Good day, John. How are you? Good, thank you. So we're here to talk about a couple of things this morning. Gorav is away, so the amateurs are taking over. Uh, we're going to be talking about branding. This is something that I feel analysts often, I wouldn't say underappreciate, but don't really fully understand in the way that maybe I conceive of it, having worked in advertising at the beginning of what could loosely call, be called my career. What do you guys feel uh, collectively about branding in terms of assessing a business? Graham, let's start with you. Uh... Well, I think it serves, uh, I mean, it, it, it always serves an important purpose if there any business because it distinguishes it from the competition. It's what the customers are interacting with directly usually. Uh, it kind of sets the tone of what the customer is going to buy, sets expectations. And so, yeah, you can get things very wrong if, you're, if your branding is different to what you're selling accidentally. Uh, you don't want people thinking they're going to the opera and actually turning up at a rock concert or something or other. So it's... Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's very important. And you can also see the brands that that do particularly well, that really hold people's loyalty. They can they can just earn a fortune compared to all their competition. Uh, Apple being yeah. a good example. Uh, there might not be much difference in the technology, but there's a brand behind it that people love and respect, so they can charge a lot more. Yeah, and I think when we, when we all started out on our, our journey in value investing, where Warren Buffett is kind of the icon and you often hear Warren Buffett talk about Coca-Cola and how the brand there, the brand value is just incredible when you're really just selling sugary water. Uh, the product itself isn't anything without the brand. Nick, what, what's your view on branding in the role of analysis? Uh, it's it's incredibly important, but I find it um, incredibly uh, hard to put into sort of anything else you do as an analyst. So most of the stuff we do is quantitative. We look at financial statements, and this is the qualitative side. And most of the investment analysts are late to find brands. Brands pop up first, and then they're um, you know, talked about as the next big thing. But that can also happen in reverse, as brands are sometimes, yeah, blockbuster um, video was yeah. one of the greatest brands for a while, and then Netflix completely destroyed it pretty much overnight. It only took one or two years. So that's what makes it hard as an investment analyst. Brands come, but they can also go very quickly. Mm. I think we could talk about AMP in that context, uh, a great Australian brand that uh, really destroyed itself. It was an act of Harry Carey. But before we get into that, maybe we could just start with some definitions of what brand is, because I think a lot of investors, when they hear the word brand, they think of a logo. And I, I don't think that's it. My, my perception of brand is how how the customers feel about a business. I mean, it's kind of an amorphous thing. So that would be an aggregation of all of the things that a company does externally and the perceptions that that forms in customers' minds. And if you think about that definition in terms of AMP, when I arrived in Australia, I saw AMP up there with Qantas in terms of the strength of that brand. It had just been there forever. I think the company had been going maybe 150 years at that time. It seemed as though it was an impregnable brand in the same way that Qantas feels as though it's an impregnable brand. What were your perceptions of AMP 20 years ago? Nick, if you want to take that on. Yeah, no, um... So I guess I'm a little bit younger than uh, both of you guys, so I probably don't have the... Hey, uh, hey, hey, I, I don't have very <laughs> many memories of 20 years there, ago man. either. <laughs> have you actually heard of AMP? <laughs> I, I only briefly in passing. Um, 
as your grandparents uh, mention it. <laughs> yeah, it was sort of put up at this, you know, financial, you know, steward and and every everything in finance sort of ran through AMP. You know, you go there for insurance, your financial planning, your banking in some cases. Mm. Um, and over the last decade, but it's pretty much ever since I think it listed, um, mm-hmm. it, it's it's just gone backwards. And I mean, more recently, um, the way I remember it is they had this decision to open up their platform and, and uh, to their own advisors and put external funds on there. They chose not to. They chose to promote their own products. Um, and then they, they had to keep advisors there by offering them this uh, ridiculous incentive package where like, the buyer of last resort, which is now going to court, mm-hmm. um, which they reneged on. And it's just been step after step of mismanagement of that entire brand. Whereas mm-hmm. you look at that in... Um, against something like Macquarie, which it would have been much more than two decades ago. Uh, and they've been able to morph that brand and move into different products. Um, and, I mean, you always say put the customer first, but it, it can go both ways, I guess, particularly with Macquarie because they do charge some obscene fees. But if you look at both those brands and you put them against each other, it's been this two completely different paths over the last two decades. What would your take be, Graham? Yeah, it's a good example of where a company can't, a brand just isn't a static thing, that it, a company really has to nurture it just as if they were going to nurture um, a pot plant or something. Because if it's not growing or it's not at least maintaining itself, you're going to be getting kind of a negative effect uh, as it works its way through. And the other thing is that it, it AMP is a good example of where complexity can really muddy that up, that you get lots of different messages being thrown at customers and then that can uh impact their perception of the brand which then feeds back to their inability to kind of use it as a distinguishing feature versus the competition and yeah that cycle kind of breaks where it's uh it's just unable to stand out from the crowd again because there's just too much complexity behind it Mm. so Mm. yeah it's it's an interesting example i think um for me a, a brand is i mean companies constantly talk about investing in their brand and that's true companies should invest in their brand but it's it's so easily done through behaviors and conduct that can really undermine a business from the from the inside out and i think amp is just a perfect example of that and before before the podcast i made a list of the things that i could just recall um, that really just destroyed AMP's brand. And we can go back to George Trumbull, who is an American CEO of AMP, probably 15 years ago now. He appeared on the front page of the AFR in an Indian headdress, which were, probably is inappropriate for a CEO. That was the first thing that I could remember about that business, where you go, that's a <laughs> bit off. <laughs> and then the, you, you go all the way through to the Royal Commission, where we found out they were billing dead people, they were charging fees for no service. There was a whole host of sexual harassment claims um, where those claims were admitted and proven. And the, the the person responsible in one particular case, who was the head of infrastructure, I think, was kept on and given a promotion. Um, there was bullying, intimidation by senior staff. If you go onto Glassdoor, <laughs> look at AMP staff reviews, they're still saying pretty much the same thing. There was this real feeling that that business was just a boys club. And yet when you looked at the brand from an out, from the outside, it was this sturdy, enduring, trustworthy business that had been established a long time ago and it endured. And in the space of that decade or more, that whole thing was just destroyed. And I think this is one of the key things that investors need to appreciate about a brand is that it's it's not res- it gives you some resistance to poor behavior and it gives you some uh, defense but it it really if you don't have that alignment between what a company does and how it projects itself visually into the world then if those two things aren't coherent you're just undermining it all the time and i think this is um an interesting issue as far as Tabcor is concerned, which is something that you've been working on lately, Graham. How does a brand in a business like Tabcor uh, really help sustain that that business in such a competitive field? Yeah, that's an interesting one because 
kind of like AMP, it's had to evolve quite a bit over the years. If you go back to the Tab Corp of uh, 20 years ago, it was kind of on tracks. It had a real monopoly. There was no competition online or anything. Uh, it, it was a regulated monopoly. Then suddenly in the last decade or so, it's had to suddenly compete against all of these online brands. They were much fresher and were able to kind of start from scratch without a lot of those legacy, uh, well, just whatever perceptions people had previously of Tab Corp could, would kind of carry forward and these new guys could just start from scratch. Mm. Uh, I think Tab Corp still had a big advantage because even if everyone else was shifting online or starting up online, Tab Corp could at least kind of put itself in front of the customers that were going there by habit or whatever, uh, betting through its shops to pull them online. And so it, it also has one of the biggest market shares today online. But mm. I mean that, yeah. The, and I think also possibly it, it matters what industry you're in that Tabcor for all of its issues, it's in a bit of a kind of a sin industry where people may not have the same expectations for ethical behavior as, <laughs> uh, as they would for, I don't know, some ESG stock. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure how, how it plays out, but I'm guessing that people who are trying to place a bet on Tabcor aren't thinking, oh, did the CEO get overcompensated this year? Or no. is there some sort of like, they know what they're getting into. Mm. So yeah, it might, it might not matter that much, but also, I think uh, the wagering business is just, there isn't a ton of customer loyalty there anyway. People are looking for the best odds. They're looking for convenience. And I don't I don't think that Tabcorp brand is worth nearly as much as something that is much more of a trust-based business like AMP or like, uh, I don't know, Coca-Cola, something you're going to be eating. Yeah, airlines. Uh, so, yeah, I think there are kind of different categories and that's that's what makes branding interesting. Mm. How how has Tabcore responded in a brand sense to just the the millions of online betting outfits that started over the past decade or more? Well, I wouldn't say they've responded particularly well because they've lost market share basically from the get-go until maybe this last year or so they have started to stabilize a bit, which which is nice. It means we kind of found the bottom. But uh, yeah, so I wouldn't say they responded particularly well. They often, and, and this is where they had kind of conflicting incentives, where they wanted people to stay on the track or in the retail shops because they were more profitable than the online guys. So they didn't really have the incentive as a startup to kind of shift all of their customers online by offering I don't know, some sort of experience there that was better. So this yeah, they the, had pretty the innovators dilemma in in some sense in online yeah, wagering. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They've yeah, they they've been pretty kind of slow to the game. They picked up their um their game in the last couple of years, maybe, but I think it was a bit of a forced hand where they were just losing so much market share for so long that they had to respond. Now they kind of pitch themselves as the the convenient option. Uh, they certainly don't offer the best odds for most matches. So I think they're already selecting out people who are just, who are very price sensitive and who are just looking for the best odds possible. Uh, but they might be carving out a better brand now by kind of tailoring their uh, promises to people, I guess, the better match what they can offer. Mm -hmm. So so your argument is that um, it's currently a hold, I believe, uh, but it's not far away from the buy price. Um, what's what's the the investment case for Tabcor now? Well, the the investment case is that it's. I think the main the main aspect to it is uh, that over the past decade, as the company's been kind of, or all companies have been kind of clawing at market share online, the marketing budgets of these companies have gone through the roof, tripled basically, and so that's really had an anchor on earnings, but that's probably going to slow down over the next five years, uh, I would say, just because the kind of there's been a kind of duopoly established between Tabcorp Sportsbed and then maybe some others that are much smaller. But yeah, and so now that that's kind of solidified, there isn't the need to 
push marketing so much, I think. Mm -hmm. And as that kind of eases off, you should get the earnings then returning to kind of above average growth because you've got this cost that's reducing. And that might have even got a bit of a bonus in the past couple of weeks where the government has come out and said, uh, following a report into problem gambling, said that it was considering banning advertising for these brands, uh, for all wagering brands. So yeah, it might be kind of a situation where the government is forcing them to reduce their costs. And as long as that doesn't have too much of an impact on the actual turnover of these companies, then you would expect their their profitability to go up over time. So yeah, the bottom line is that the the company might look overvalued now. It's trading on a PER of around 30 or so, uh, around 30 times earnings. But if you look kind of five years away, those earnings are probably going to grow quite significantly. And yeah, it's not it's not as expensive as it looks. Nick, I would I would draw a parallel in my own mind between where Tavcor sits and the the sort of competitive environment in online gambling with streaming services, um, mm -hmm. where there's this whole new market and there's a land grab. And at the moment you're in a very the market's in a kind of state of flux. There's so much money being spent on customer acquisition. But eventually that settles down. Companies withdraw. They realize it's too expensive. And you often end up with or a, a cozy kind of duopoly where much better margins are made. Do, do you feel as though Tab, Tabcor is in, in that kind of situation? And what kind of parallels would you draw, you know, in a branding sense with some of the U.S. businesses that you, you follow? Yeah, I am. Uh... I, th I think it is, particularly if, as Graham was talking about, these advertising brands, uh, advertising bans go through. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the cigarette industry. So mm. when the, when advertising was stopped then in that industry, uh, no other cigarette company obviously could market. And so the players that existed with the current market share, this took more market share as the smaller players die. And I think that'll... Um, probably happen in online gaming or online gambling as well. And Tab Corp and Sports Bet in Australia are the ones that uh, stand out the most to benefit. Uh, the parallels I would draw, in a sense, uh, to Uber actually. About five years ago, Uber was competing with all these players that are now all leaving the market. And the actual rides business in Uber is now quite profitable. It's actually quite a good business. Uh, and, and that that's pretty much turned into a duopoly in the US between Lyft and Uber. And Uber, I think, has got far more than 50% market share. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised. I think it's a similar market share, Graham can correct me, but um, with Tab Corp and Sports, but who already probably have 75 or 80% market. Uh, and if advertising expand, well, I think they almost go and get the rest as well because no one can compete. Uh, and then the other thing with the sin industries is the taxes. So once taxes go up, the same thing happened with cigarettes. Only the biggest can survive. Uh, and this actually sort of happened to Uber a little bit. There was all these rules and regulations around where people could drive, what um, you had to pay certain cities, and that just lends itself to the biggest players, um, similar to a company like Airbnb as well. Graham, in, um, just on the regulatory aspects there that Nick's touched on, do you feel as though, like, you, you hear the ACCC talk about competition and they would normally like more players in a market. Um, but when you think about markets from a regulatory point of view, you can see that the regulators might prefer fewer larger companies than lots of smaller ones. Do you think that could help Tabcor too? Uh, yeah, I think it, it follows a similar line of thinking to the casinos. Uh, you can see... I mean, some regions in the world, such as uh, Nevada, will will allow people to open casinos anywhere they want, basically. Uh, whereas Australia has a different approach, where it's kind of decided that every city has a monopoly or a near monopoly, mm -hmm. and uh, that's just a much easier thing to manage from a uh, customer safety perspective, I guess. So it wouldn't surprise me if wagering goes the same way. They're basically just online casinos of a different kind. So. They're, they're almost the outlier now that there is allowed to be so much competition, at least by Australian standards. Uh, yeah, the the gambling industry has historically been much more concentrated and regulated, so wouldn't surprise me if it goes back to that. This has just been a bit of a Wild West situation as things 
uh, as a new frontier was discovered. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think Tabcor closed yesterday at a dollar and eleven cents. We've got it as a buy at a dollar, so that's something that members should watch out for. Uh, we'll be keeping a close eye on that stock and hope to put it on the buy list in the future. Let's move on now to um, some of the prices of small companies have really just shot up over the past month or two. Does this does this seem to be of any any significance in terms of uh, market psychology and and where we're at now? We've seen some incredible price rises in some of the stocks that you guys follow. Uh, maybe we could just talk about uh, a few of them, Nick, the, the, uh, the stocks that you've covered where the prices really have shot up rapidly over the past month or two. Yeah, if I just look at the sort of the ones we have in the international select, um, how we find a, a few have risen quite strongly. So how I look at it is the start of the year was mainly a relief rally in technology businesses that mm-hmm. had been, um, particularly US businesses that had been... Uh, 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 heavily, they declined heavily last year. And then we sort of had, by about March, this AI boom, and video came out with this amazing update and everyone thought, or continues to think AI is going to be the next big thing. Mm-hmm. And then over the last probably six weeks, small caps have really joined in the rally and now it's just become the everything rally. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I sent through something the other day on a business called Nicola. Which is this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is this terrible um, you know, electric vehicle truck manufacturer in the US? Uh, Nick, Nick and- before you go on, let's just say that this business was a fraud. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, and, it, it, and, yeah. And that the founder of that company was caught um, showing the electric truck that they'd driven, sort of charging along a highway, which wasn't mm-hmm. actually a highway; it was a hill. And they were just rolling it down the hill. <laughs> oh yes. wow! Yes, yeah. And, and this was this is what one point a fifteen billion dollar business in that um, mm. whole sort of spack and speculative run up in uh, two thousand twenty one. But that business was a three hundred billion dollar, I guess, sort of fraud four mm. weeks ago. <laughs> and now it's a one point six billion dollar business. It's up four times in the last month. And, and this is right mm. across the board. Like so, the speculation, the market has returned. I read a stat the other day, retail investors are now uh, uh, transacting at the same levels as they were at the top of the 2021 sort of speculative bubble. So it's a, it's a bit of a worry, but because when you see all small cap companies go up, you assume it's just strong fundamentals, but then you look around and it's just everything as well um, yeah. um, beside it. But uh, what's some, um, so Ali Financial is a company we own in the Select Value Fund. It's uh, it does automotive uh, financing uh, and lending, and that's that's probably up twenty odd percent in the last month. Um, Yeti, uh, a, a brand again that we've talked about that may or may not endure is the big risk there, and that's probably up a similar amount. Uh, yeah, so it, 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 there's a lot of companies, and it's, what I would say is it's just an everything rally at the moment. Graham, hmm. have you got any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. The, I think that there was a period kind of earlier in the year at the end of last year where there was a this, this big kind of cloud of pessimism over particularly technology stocks, but uh, small caps in general. And so the run up now, it might be partly just it's, it's hard to say whether things are kind of overshooting now or just correcting the, the excess pessimism of earlier in the year. Uh, but I mean, when you get those kind of stories of frauds that are doubling in price, it reminds me of what was a what was the company a couple of years ago during the height, and it went bankrupt, and then people kept buying it after it went bankrupt. Um, there, was, there was two a few. There was a there's few. A few. Hertz. Yeah, Hertz was one. Hertz, that's the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that kind of just smells of the same situation where people are just completely ignoring risk. They just they just want to buy. Uh, yeah, it could be that starting up again. It wouldn't surprise me if the AI thing does lead to a another speculative boom because it's it just has that nice story that you can take to an absolute extreme mm-hmm. and uh, just dream things go to the sky with it. So yeah, yeah, I yeah. I get the sense that that's just picking up. We'll see. I think that's true. I I did a I did a couple of stories on the the looming AI bubble, and if you look at things like um, 
earnings calls, transcripts, and CEOs using the phrase AI. It's just gone from yeah. nowhere a year ago to just littered in almost every earnings call now. So yeah, that's yeah, definitely I, I, that's a, a good sign, sign of, so. of where this is going. But it, it does seem that that investor psychology seems to be very resilient, more so than it used to be. <laughs> Nothing seems to be able to dent this enthusiasm. Uh, it, it, it's we've been sitting here waiting for for cheap stocks, and there's been very very few of them over the past year or so. Yeah, it's a surprise. With interest rates higher, you can the maths is very simple. That all things being equal, the higher interest rate today versus a year ago should mean stocks fell twenty five percent or something, and it's it just hasn't happened. Which means they're twenty five percent more overvalued than they were a year ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know why that is the case, but people just keep finding reasons to be excited despite the negative news. I mean, some of these stocks, I look at a lot of the US um, home building industry and companies like Ferguson and Floor and Decor around it, but if you just single out the home builders, mm. they're approaching all time highs and revenues and earnings are down, you know, sometimes 30, 40%, and backlogs are coming off. So like, it's clear that uh, rising interest rates are having an impact in the sector. But it's not having an impact on the stock prices. It's having an impact on the financials, but again, not the stock prices. It's kind of amazing. Like all these cyclical industries that you would expect to be um, you know, hammered uh, mm. when interest rates go from zero to 5% on the, and over one of the shortest times in history, or might be the shortest time that's ever happened. Uh, but it's just not happening. It's, it's... It, it, it does yeah. make you wonder whether. People, the underlying expectation is that interest rates are going to fall as quickly as they've risen. That's what I kind of wonder. Is I I feel like the 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 most rational kind of explanation for me is that people have just become so used to low interest rates. Many investors now have only lived through periods of low interest rates. They don't even know what the high interest rates are like, and uh, that they just assume that that's the norm. And that this is the outlier rather than us just being back to kind of average interest rates. They think this is somehow some huge aberration that must return to normal. Mm. And uh, and normal is like yeah. one or 2% interest rates. I think they might think that, <laughs> but yeah, and it worryingly, me, that, it's surprising. It is. It is. And, and they might be right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, also, <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. I think they, they might be right, but it's still, like you can still get 5% on your cash in a savings account. Like there are still alternatives. So their opportunity costs are definitely going up, mm. but they don't seem to be making that equation, uh, I don't know, as you would expect. So presumably they think that stock prices must be growing at above average rates or will grow at above average rates as well. Because otherwise, why wouldn't you be switching from stocks to cash at deposits. the margin? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's, a, it's a confusing kind of environment. Um, we did publish uh, a story last week on some of the s small caps that we we liked individually that were showing some signs of life. I hasten to add that this isn't us jumping on the bubble. Um, we've been covering these mm. companies for a long time, <laughs> personally. Uh, but it, it does sound, it seem like uh, there is some life returning to this sector we do have also coming up this week is um, uh, updates to our ideas lab stories. So some of the stocks that we've covered over the past few years, which I'll be contacting you guys once this finishes uh, about <laughs> getting some words off you. <laughs> you don't know that yet, but that's going to happen. Uh, but it, it is an interesting time. And when you look at inflation rates, especially in the US, uh, the, the rapidity of that fall over there, Graham, and you're probably closer to it than us. It's, it's been quite astonishing. So you can see this is just giving some some legs, some real legs to this rally. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's yeah, we'll see what the year ahead brings. But it, it will. I wouldn't be wanting to bet things are going to mm. fall versus go up. We'll see. No, no, nor me. Nick, have you any comments on some of the US stocks that you follow? We can maybe uh, address some of those big brand names that have really been firing the rally that got it started in terms of Microsoft and Amazon and, and companies like that. We've got any comments on those? 
Yeah, I mean, well, speaking of ads, you know, we've talked about the small caps at the moment, but Microsoft hit an all-time high last night. They um, they introduced or they brought out yesterday pricing around their artificial intelligence product, Microsoft Copilot, which would be mm-hmm. like a, an assistant on top of their 365 package. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to. I think the pricing was thirty dollars, and I believe this is US dollars. Thirty dollars a user, and so people are doing the numbers and saying thirty dollars a year a year. I, I, I think it might be even per month, but I'd have to check. Okay, right. Um, and people sort of, there was numbers out this morning on it, and I think there's about 350 million uh, enterprise users. So even if mm. 100 million users pick that up and it's 30 bucks, like it's, it's quite mm. meaningful and, and it probably won't cost them an awful lot to, to run. There will be some computing costs, but... They um, obviously do that themselves through Azure, but it's um, it's just an example of you talking about artificial intelligence potential bubbles, I guess. Uh, but there are there are real products behind this, and just like the dot com boom, uh, there are real products and real revenue um, sources um, coming. But mm. there's also all the other uh, you know, weeds, I guess, that are just jumping on and including artificial intelligence in every presentation to pump up their stock prices. Have you actually used any of their AI products inside Office? Uh, I to write emails and do presentations and stuff? I haven't yet, but I've seen them pop up more and more. Um, and it, it, they do, like, I've noticed it particularly in emails, they'll, it used to be that they might be, like, finish a word, but now they're, like, finishing a sentence or half a sentence. Yeah. Um but it's it's coming, and then there's stuff like they they can now uh, summarize this entire call, but on Teams, of course, uh, and you know, so do the transcript. And I just think about how that could be incredibly be valuable. Like, it'll be like two but two bullet points. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Graham, have you used have you used any of Microsoft's AI products? Uh, not directly, but just for the first time the other day, actually, I used, I decided to use ChatGPT to try and write an Excel equation, uh, an Excel function, uh, Mm -hmm. based on a description. And so I was, I had no idea what the function was going to be because it was very complex. And so I thought, well, I'll see what ChatGPT comes up with if I just ask it in normal language and then Mm -hmm. tell it to give me the function. And it made it perfectly. What would have taken me surely an hour or something to put together was done in uh, in a split second. So wow. it's those kind of things. And, and I'm sure that'll be integrated into Excel, but it's the kind of thing where maybe that $30 a month, what I like about that is that it, it really is adding value on the other end to the user as well. That if every user of Excel can suddenly save an hour a day, then that's worth a lot more than $30 a month. So who knows what the pricing will be once people get familiar with it and can actually start seeing the benefits of using it it's so, it's an interesting thing because yeah. when I, I have used some of those functions um and the email client i use has got an ai option as well and i tend not to use it because it just makes everything sound bland with the same kind of tone of voice and as a word person that sort of slightly offends me but and you guys are much much better on excel than me but for me just paying 30 30 a month just to mess around on excel and 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 actually instead of me researching what function I need to use in order to do something in a spreadsheet, that would be exceptional value for money for me. That would save me mm-hmm. hours per week. So there is some real value yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I, I think that's the, the the whole point. Like, So a lot of people say, oh, not many businesses will adopt this. It'll be 5 or 10%. But there's a world where this could be half or even 80%. Um, particularly once it starts transcribing things, produces its own PowerPoints, which it can sort of do now. Mm. I've always got to remind myself that this is version one, right. essentially. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, the one we see is pretty much version one, even though it's 3.5, but the one they've released to the public. Uh, what's this? What's the version going to be like in three or four years? And you know, yeah. how amazing it's, is it going to be? Yeah, it's not. I mean, my my comments about the impersonality of the emails it might create for you is is an example, I think, because if you write into chat GPT for now, write 500 words on this in the style of John Addis, it will come back with something that worryingly isn't far off my writing style. And I'm sure that will be true of you two, too. There's enough body Mm -hmm. of work out there now with our names on it Ah. for it to make 
an assessment as to how we write. Um, obviously, there's less swear it words. It might know us better than we jokes, know us. But <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's even more worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's fascinating times. Um, I think we should probably wrap this up. Maybe just let's wrap this up by talking about ARB and bring it back to brands. ARB is probably one of the best businesses Australia has produced, in my view. I don't know how you guys feel about it. And you look at that outward projection of the business in terms of its branding, and it is one of the most 70s logos you are ever likely to see, I think. And I feel as though it's a genius piece of branding because it hasn't been updated. It -hmm. gives you that feeling that it's been there so long. It's rugged. The brand itself is rugged, and you expect it to see it covered in mud and sand. Yeah, and we don't care really, about visuals. We're just here for that's right. We we're, we're yeah. here for something that endures, that's stable and enduring. And I think that the the outward projection of that business's values through its products is just perfectly aligned with the way that that brand presents itself on those little stickers in the back of four wheel drives. It's just a perfect expression of what good branding is. But it only talks to the audience that appreciates it. If you're not into four wheel driving, if you don't really care about that kind of stuff and you look at that logo and you go, oh, my God, how old is that car to have a sticker like that on it? So uh, they really, really understand their audience well. And I suggest any member who's interested in diving into the world of brands and seeing some of the complexities and issues that it raises for investors. ARB is a really good example of how you can create a brand over time that really does speak to its audience almost to the exclusion of those who don't understand it and don't need to understand it it's just a perfect expression in the way that apple is too in a very different way yeah what's so amazing i think about arb is they're selling very mundane products like you can't really touch feel or use the ball bar and you don't intend to use it. you don't really want to use it right no. like, yeah and but they've been able to create a whole brand image where they can charge twice as much as the competitor. I remember doing the um a bit of research into it. And I went to one of their stores and none of the items in their stores have a price tag. And it's not the usually you see this in luxury fashion because if you need to ask the price, you can't afford it. But that's not the case with ARB. What they're trying to do is create a conversation um, and create a customer service opportunity. So I have to go and ask, oh, how much is this pretty much on every item? Um, and then they can come along and say, oh, it, you know, it's $2,000. What are you doing? I'm going on an overland trip around Australia. Oh, well, you might need this as well. Have you thought about this? This is my favourite campsite. And just reinforce the whole thing that, you know, this is a brand that's, well, I guess their marketing is, will get you there. Um, and it's it's been like that since day one. I mean, the origins of the brand were, uh, I think it was Tony Brown in 1975, drove from Victoria, the Northern Territory, and all these products fell off his car. That was crap. And so, <laughs> so he's like any good entrepreneur, he said, I'll do it myself. And that sort of endured, as he said, throughout its whole history. Yeah. And also I think um, the first time that we had a site visit, I think it was Gareth Brown, who's now an analyst at Forager, uh, came down to melbourne and went to the it went to arb in the wherever it was i think it's in the western suburb somewhere and he just came back and he said is exactly how i hoped it would be and he said well, what do you mean he said well I, I turned up at the car park and there was just four-wheel drives everywhere and they were all covered in mud they'd all been out four-wheel driving at the weekend and mm. i walked into the offices and the, the carpet was really grungy and horrible because they'd all been stepping their, their boots <laughs> through the carpet and the secondhand filing cabinets. He said, it was just exactly what you'd want that business to be. You know, they're not trying to create a fancy office environment. They're not trying to create an impression to the people who work in those offices. They all love four wheel drives. And, and the expression of what that business is, is, is through the products, not the environments they're trying to create where you're managing those brands and those products. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good example. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll call it a day. Uh, thank you, Graham, for staying up and showing us your nice trinkets in the in the background. There. <laughs> some, Thanks, some, John. Some fossilized agate or wood timber. And thank you, Nick. <laughs> Thanks, John.